Generic greetings and welcome to Science Insanity, a channel dedicated to bringing my love of science fiction in all its wondrous stupidity and glory to you, the viewer. And along for the ride is my friend and oh-so-lovable co-host, Steve, filling in for the science illiterate, and whom I will exposit to and whom shall provide wonderful comedic commentary. Say hello, Steve. Hello. The classic intro. I promise you he's more exciting than this normally. Although, he wasn't here last month. I did forget to feed him by accident. I lost the key to the basement door lock, so he might be a little bit off, but it's okay. Please forgive him. It was my mistake, honestly. I have returned. I have been fed. Thank you to all those that have fed me. <laughs> he is. He has been fed, and today is a today is a wonderful episode. We're going to be talking about meat ships and organic meat fighters and all just disgusting, disgusting Disgusting, disgusting sci-fi technology, which is probably going to throw everyone for a loop who clicked on this based on just the thumbnail. But the topic of the day, the Cylon Base Star from Battlestar Galactica, the classic ship from the remastered series, the terrifying tool of toaster domination, the thing that they use to wipe out the 12 colonies of man. But first, because I am greedy, and apparently it has been working, I am going to shill like my life depends on it. If you would like to support Science Insanity and gain access to our content a day early with all the stuff that we have to cut to keep the runtime down and YouTube appropriate, go check out our Patreon. If you'd like, buy me a coffee, or if you're feeling generous, feed Steve to make sure that he's well enough to do these episodes. And if space bucks are running a little bit short, just check the videos out in the rest of our channel, spread it around, like, subscribe, everything helps. So, Steve, are you ready to go? Of course, certainly. So I have been fed now. What do you what do you remember about the Cylon Base Star? And before you say anything, you're not allowed to say that the name is confusing with the Colonial Battle Stars. That was like a running thing. That's the one thing you're not allowed to say you remember. Um, I'm a little bit confused because of the battle. I st <laughs> <laughs> we're, yeah, we're I <laughs> immediately we're immediately off to a great start. Okay. Uh, Strike one. Uh, I remember they looked uh pretty interesting there with all their points. Um, and uh, they didn't really have armor or survivability uh, class cannons. Holy shit, you remembered so much more than I thought you were. I thought you were just going to come in here and be like, it is uh, the Cylon base ship and uh, it looks like a star. I was genuinely expecting that to be the extent of your knowledge. I mean, it's, it's that too, so, but, <laughs> you know, I do try to remember some things we discuss. Oh my god, this completely ruined a joke I wrote as well. I literally put in my bullet points, everything Steve said is wrong, make a joke about it, and then point it out. You completely ruined it. You, you... <laughs> Oh my god. So, before we really truly get into the episode proper, I would like to say this video, for anyone that saw the Doniger video from last week, is going to be the exact opposite of that one. When I was talking about the Donny there, I was basically just shamelessly glorifying and praising that ship to hell and back because it is awesome and I love it and hard sci-fi is cool. Despite the fact that every single time the Doniger shows up on screen, it is getting its ass clapped and blown to hell. In much the same way, the Cylon Base Star is a massive, imposing weapon of war that spends all of its scream time getting absolutely bodied. But I hate it. It is one of the most stupid ship designs I have ever seen with just the most ridiculous decisions ever creatively and technically from both in and out of universe. It is just the Cylon Base Star versus the Galactica. The first is meant to intimidate and scare the enemy. The second is meant to beat its ass back to the scrapyard it crawled out of. We need to establish also right off the rip, there will be just colossal plot holes and glaring issues and just dumb design involved in this video. And it was made that way because of meta real life stuff. The Cylons needed to be the enemies of the week. They basically get bodied because they're comedic bad guys. They're, they're generic thugs in the background. So you have to keep that in mind as we talk about the ship. Chat GPT will not stand for this. You know, I don't actually know what ChatGPT is. I've seen memes with that all over it's the place. It's an AI. That's, that's about all you need to know to understand the joke. Oh, so it's like every VTuber ever. Got it. No. <laughs> all right, all right. Maybe not every that you need to understand the joke. <laughs> that's... that's uh, we'll get it. It's fine. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's, it's fine. Yeah, it's okay. Whoosh, straight over my head. 
So, the Cylon Base Star was designed as the, and I wish I was kidding when I say this, final solution to the problem of humanity and the Twelve Colonies. Yo, I've, I've heard that before. Yeah, uh, we're drawing unfortunate parallels here, so we're gonna move on really quickly before they can spiral out of control. They were essentially the tool that the Cylons used to end the Cold War of Extinction being waged by both sides after the signing of the Armistice and conclusion of the First Cylon War. The Base Star we see is an evolution of prior designs. The Cylon Base Star began as the giant twin dinner plate design that we know and love, evolving into a spoked carrier missile boat hybrid and the precursor to the modern Base Star, and finally the twin Y-hull design that appears in the RDM TV show. And I need to get you some images because it occurs to me in my incredible haste that I did not actually properly prepare everything that I should have. Wow, such a Canadian moment. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Gives you two weeks to prepare for it and... Look, other things happened. It is what it is. I've got them on hand. I just don't have them pulled up and ready to go. So that is what Man I meant. generated the lowest quality image oh, imaginable. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. It's okay. Here, look, let me get an even lower quality one for you. It'll it'll be even better. Oh, Boom. thank you. Check it. Look at that. Don't you love it? I appreciate you. <laughs> God, that's so small. <laughs> it's, like, it's like 240 by 100 pixels. <laughs> So anyways, like I was saying, that first image is sort of the in-between. That's the evolution of the Cylon Base Star. The original one was just the colossal piss-off dinner plate that everyone knows and loves. Here's an image of that, by the way. It, it just a monstrosity. And over time, the ships gradually got a more sleek design. They turned into the spoked design that you see there, the Cylon Base Star. And eventually, they evolved into the modern base ship with the twin Y-hull design, capable of inverting itself to look like that oh-so-wonderful star that it is named after. So we went from basically two Millennium Falcons just put together to inverse Ys. This is the best AI can come up with. <laughs> this is the... Oh, Oh, you have no idea how much worse it gets. It's like, oh, AI design is going to take over? No, this is the classic example of why AI are stupid. This thing is terrible. I hate it. They should have stuck with the dinner plate. It was so much better. However, like I was saying, the, the modern base ship, despite the fact that it looks way different and is significantly smaller than all of the other base ships it's designed off of, was pretty much made to fill a very specific role in the Cylon's plan. The reason that the first Cylon War ended with the armistice that it did was due to the Final Five, a group of humanoid Cylons from the long lost 13th colony of man. Don't worry if you don't remember that, it's not really important. They met the current robotic Cylons that were waging the war against humanity and agreed to assist them in creating humanoid Cylons and hybrids to assist in their goal of evolution and advancement. These humanoid Cylons would spend years infiltrating the Twelve Colonies and working their way into as many positions of power, authority, and influence as they could in order to destabilize and cripple humanity's ability to fight back at the advent of the Second Cylon War. Part of this effort was something called the Command Navigation Program, created by Gaius Baltar, the most punchable-sounding scientist ever. It was basically an operating system for all colonial battle stars and support craft that, in testing, had proved to make the effectiveness, lethality, and reaction time of colonial fleet greater than even the best that the Cylons had at the end of the First War. Of course, the toasters subverted it, so it was like, oh, fantastic, this is a wonderful Windows operating system, let me just replace it with Windows 10. And that's basically what happened with most of the colonial fleet, so... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We went for a wonderful operating system to replace it, so you're replacing it with Windows 11. You, you gotta get your Windows versions right here, man. Look, I'll be honest, my experience is that every single time Windows updates is basically like having free malware installed on your computer, so I, well, as far I as mean, I'm concerned... That's, as, that's just a Bill Gates moment. <laughs> I, I get them mixed up. Every single time an update happens, I hate it. So as far as I'm concerned, they're all terrible. They're all malware. Understandable. Dr. Baltar's work on the CNP was subverted and manipulated by his lover and co-writer, a Cylon agent playing the longest con and surprisingly not the longest lasting case of blue balls ever, who wrote in multiple backdoors and exploits to the CNP that Cylon electronic warfare could exploit to devastating effect. Yo, I'm gonna need to... 
you to to uh, explain yourself with that real quick. You know exactly what needs explained. I was gonna I was gonna move on from it and just leave it unexplained, but I just had no. the, I just had the worst thought imaginable. So the, the humanoid Cylons, they look like humans, okay? They're, they're basically robots okay. that feel and look like humans, and they're <clears throat> mostly undetectable because they got fleshy organic bits in them, right? Okay? okay? And they used said fleshy organic bits to seduce and manipulate Gaius Baltar. Canonically, they smashed. All right, all right. I'm, I'm good. That's all I need to know. Back on track. The reason the Cylons decided on this course of action was due to their predictions and simulations of the end result of the Second Human Cylon War. They basically spent years wargaming out what would happen using different strategies and such. Part of the reason the ceasefire was proposed, and not only due to the Final Five, was because humanity was becoming an unstoppable military juggernaut. As the Twelve Colonies, independently, the Cylons were winning the war. They were crushing their independent militaries pretty handedly. After they united under one front and began coordinating resource, industry, and manpower, the tide gradually began to turn against the Cylons, culminating in several large counter-offensives such as the Ghost Fleet Offensive and Operation Raptor Talon that devastated Cylon fleets and destroyed outposts and shipyards. With the early models of Minerva battle stars held it heralding the creation of the Mercury, which is just the destroyer of worlds, and the Valkyrie class alongside prototypes of the Mark VII Viper, the colonial fleet was expanding rapidly and was, according to the Cylons' own predictions, insurmountable in the next war. They would have been smashed, and honestly, considering that the Galactica and the Pegasus like kick the shit out of most of the Cylons every time they show up, Having a fleet of hundreds of those things rolling around probably would have just been an immediate shit stomp in humanity's favor. Probably. So the Cylons believed that they were absolutely unable to beat humanity in the next conventional fight. So with the infiltration of the CNP on hand, their strategy shifted to a decisive first strike Japanese style. The specifications of the modern base ship were thus born to fulfill said role. Designed with the intention of hammering the 12 colonies as hard as possible while the colonial fleet was disabled and vulnerable due to their infiltration, the modern base star was built with an exclusive focus on the strongest weaponry known to both sides, nuclear warheads. It was also designed to carry as many fighters as possible in order to counter colonial vipers and serve as the advanced strike force and cleanup crew after the initial waves of nuclear bombardment, cleaning up any ships that could potentially have survived infiltration from the CNP. It was also to carry a more advanced jump drive and propulsion than any other ship before it, capable of jumping well past even the farthest range of any prior ship. This was so that it could remain hidden deep in Cylon space past the Armistice Line and jump all the way to the colonies directly without the Colonials ever realizing what kind of first strike weapon they had developed. So, with that brief history of why it was designed the way it was out of the way and what it was supposed to do, commit a nuclear holocaust, let's talk about its design more directly and I can explain why this thing is mind-bendingly stupid. And we're going to start with just, you know, the basic dimensions of it and some raw numbers. The base star measures in at just over a kilometer long from extended point to point, slightly smaller when it's in its dual tandem Y configuration. 350-ish meters wide and 265 meters tall at its greatest extent. These numbers, like I said, they fluctuate a little bit because the ship can reorient itself a couple different ways, so it's mm -hmm. a little inconsistent, but close enough. Generally, it is a little bit longer and taller than the Galactica, while being a little shorter and smaller than the Mercury class. That's an easy way to visualize it. The Cylon base right. star comes equipped with an eye-watering, truly insane science insanity. <laughs> uh, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, I had to. <laughs> the opportunity was the there, I had to take didn't. it. I did, I did the thing. <laughs> it is equipped with a frankly disgusting... 220 individual rapid reload and fire missile launchers capable of firing conventional nuclear or cluster munitions. These weapons are almost exclusively mounted in the prongs of the ship closer towards the end rather than the central column. So you see the tandem Y-hull design, basically all of the actual missile launchers are pretty much out on the tippy ends of the, uh, the ship there. So if you basically blow those off, congratulations, the ship now has no more armaments left, which we will get to. Congratulations, later. it's no longer functional as a ship. 
The reason for all of the weapons being clustered on the external spokes is because while the base ship can vomit out a truly ridiculous number of missiles, the real stupid part is that the entire central column and all of the base of the spokes contain thousands of Cylon Raiders, with 800 individual launch bays and potentially thousands of Raiders at their greatest extent stored within. There are also several pressurized hangars for heavy raiders and larger strike craft as well to allow the hybrids in the humanoid Cylons who need to breathe, like pathetic, weak, fleshy humans, the space that they need to embark and disembark from the ship. Unfortunately, before anyone ats me in the comments, I'm aware of this, the animation team for the BSG show are cowards. They retconned this semi-accidentally in the show, so the number of hangars and stuff is wrong. The first 3D models we see are accurate to what I just explained, but later on, in order to make the hangars more visible and readable on screen, as well as actually show the missile launchers and stuff in future battles, they reduce the number of hangars down to about 430. They should have simply burned more money rendering the more detailed model. Cowards. Simply. As for the actual ship itself, it is... so weird. This is getting into the part where I'm saying we're going to be talking about meat ships, because we are. It is a grotesque biomechanical nightmare. It's all meat, baby. All the way down. A giant flying meatball. The whole thing. Is it a mobile Arby's? Is that what's happening here? They have Pretty the much. They have the meats. All of them. While the old Cylon base stars were, you know, like conventional ships made of materials and wires and cables and metals and shit... And the Cylon base star, to a degree, is similar. It has conventional armor plating and structural beams made from a titanium alloy. The vast majority of the ship's mass and internals are made of that biomechanical compound that's capable of self-repair and growth. These ships are essentially grown, not really built, which is just so weird to think about. If chunks are blasted off the ship, it can gradually, through semi-unknown means, regrow this organic tissue and repair itself. We even see from an episode in the show that a rebel base ship during a Cylon Civil War, piloted by, well, rogue Cylons who join humanity, that some of the spokes were completely blown off, and many episodes later, they're actually mostly repaired. The base ship, from what's shown, is capable of potentially even regenerating up to half of its mass, like entire sections of the ship are just completely destroyed, and they do manage to repair back to almost full functionality. Although it can't regenerate like its fighters and ammunition and stuff, that's got to be manufactured and brought in from outside. So, basically a salamander is what I'm hearing here. I don't know if it's actually salamanders that regenerate, uh, it's, but it's, it's some kind along of, it's, those lines. Yeah, it's some kind of lizard. Some kind of lizard. Close enough, close enough. It's so weird that they went with this design choice when they remade the series, because out of everything they could have done, like nanites, repair drones, 3D matter printers, all the other sci-fi shenanigans, no. The Cylons are made of meat. The toasters... Oh, regenerating meat. <laughs> yeah, it just... The, the toasters are literally flying through space on a rack of ribs powered by sausage links. Like, just what a world we live in. As for the actual armor and survivability of the base star, it is absolutely awful. Not only is the ship designed in such a way that it can't carry much armor at all due to the spindly nature of its spokes, but the massive amount of ammunition in hangar bays. On Colonial Battle Stars, the hangars are on extended flight pods, so they can be independently armored and reinforced. Your average Battle Star can comfortably survive having its flight pods ripped off, but if the hangar on a Cylon base star is heavily damaged, it's probably taking the rest of that half of the ship with it, because whatever blew it up, is probably not contained within that one hangar. There are no small explosives here. <laughs> I'm pretty sure in the Battlestar videos, which shameless self-promo, go check out the uh, the Mercury class and the Jupiter class Battlestar videos. Their their guns are disgustingly large. Like they are, they're firing basically train-sized projectiles. The the base star cannot even hope to to handle these things. Like can't tank them, can't shrug them off, can't dodge them. It just dies. Like I was saying though, despite having similar dimensions to the Galactica in great extent, like how big the thing is, its mass is so, so much lower that we see multiple times in this show that single nuclear missiles or even small barrages of well-placed shots from colonial munitions will literally rip these ships in half, like I said. It's also prudent to mention that the base star has no form of anti-fighter munitions or weapons at all. 
No point defense rockets or anti-fighter missiles of any kind. None. Nada. So, multiple times, we see random dudes in their stupid little space fighters fly around with nuclear missiles and blow up a capital ship that's like a thousand times their size. It is ridiculous. They're just allowed to get away with that because the Cylons didn't think, hmm, yeah, maybe someone's going to attack us at some point. This is the best AI can come up with? This is, in fact, the best AI can come up with, yeah. It's fantastic. You might as well have outsourced it to, like, uh, one of those AI image generators probably would have done a better job. What's really funny, though, hilarious even, is that in canon, the base star is supposed to be able to hack and redirect almost any form of guided munition using an incredibly powerful electronic warfare suite, which, you know, fair enough. They're basically Skynet. They're, they're AI. It makes sense that they would be able to do that, right? They can overpower all other computer systems. Okay. Funny part about that. There's, uh, there's only two forces to fight in the BSG universe, humanity and other Cylons. During the Civil War, the other Cylons can counter your hacking by just, like, counter-hacking their missiles, or getting into a tug-of-war with you, and in that case, the missile just keeps on the heading it was before, so completely pointless. And the humans just go, nah, bro, we ain't doing that, none of that nerd shit. Independent targeting or just dumb fire missiles, there you go. Once they launch the missile, it's just going. It's a fire and forget weapon. Doesn't even have any signals or anything that you could potentially use to hack it. What? 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 It, you can't even jam them because most of them don't operate on like radar guidance. Like it. Just, it does nothing. This feature is never used. It's pointless. They built this super advanced hacking system into this ship, and it doesn't do anything. They had to forego the point defenses so they could get that in there. They, they were. Re they really needed it in there. So. God, this is this is like up there with the Bob Semple tank in in layers of just completely fucking useless design. Like, hey why man, would you put this here? Don't don't you be shit talking to Bob Semple. <laughs> it had, it had corrugated steel roofing as its armor, dude. I will shit talk that yeah. tank until the end of time. <laughs> so the only survivability that the Cylon base star has is not being hit, which is trash since it lives in a setting where the entire battle doctrine of humanity is, and I'm paraphrasing, I will plant my fist in your face, feed you your own teeth, and there's nothing you can do about it, Chrome Dome nerd. Literally the definition of stereotypical jock. Surprisingly though, the Cylon base star is actually quite fast for its size and awkward shape, even though it doesn't have any visible engines. Best guesses here were kinda going off of speculation, but the base star has, and this is gonna sound like mumbo jumbo, but bear with me, it has an inertial engine. Basically what it does is it uses gravitational fields and inertia to move the ship around, accelerating it as if it were in a gravity well, but only locally confined to the actual ship itself. So the base star experiences no issues with acceleration, it has no issues moving itself around, and it doesn't need an engine. This also allows the base star to be able to move in three dimensions without needing to reorient. It can be moving left and then all of a sudden randomly it's moving up and it hasn't changed its orientation whatsoever. Let's them move real weird when they're in space. I think it runs on pieces of toast. You know what? Honestly, both of us could be wrong, but no one knows for certain. So as long as nobody can prove you wrong, you are correct. Congratulations, the Cylon base star is powered by toast. So, the greatest advantage that the base ship actually has is its AI control and coordination systems. With the most advanced electronic warfare suite pretty much ever developed, and the ability to coordinate and control its thousands strong radar complement, the base star was designed to be pretty much the final word in advanced computing and battlefield command capabilities. And, unfortunately, that... Ooh. Oh my god, you know what? No, we're gonna come back to this, because I have so many severe problems with this in the lore, because there's some stupid shit that comes up later on, but for now, for now, we need to talk about some real heresy. The, the base ship, right, has no guns of any kind in the Battlestar Galactica universe. No guns! None! Not a single one! No point defense weapons to shoot down fighters or missiles, no main batteries to do some significant damage in a good old brawl, they literally don't even have a Cylon Centurion holding its arm out the window and doing drive-bys with its machine gun. Nothing. Which is just mind-boggling to me. We see time and again that the flak defenses from the Galactica, the Holy Wall of Flak, blessed be its name, basically completely rendering all Cylon munitions irrelevant. It's, it's literally a giant wall of, no, I don't think you will. 
And this old bucket of bolts that was pretty unarmed, like it was de-armed over the course of the war, this thing was capable of completely clowning on the Cylon base star consistently, despite the fact that the, the Galactica, the Jupiter class, was so old by the time of the actual show that it's almost criminal. It was becoming a museum ship. Even worse, later on, during the Cylon Civil War, the base ships don't even have the ability to stop incoming missiles, as when they start firing on each other, it basically boils down to whoever shoots first and gets luckiest with their missile guidance to hit something critical. And they just win. They, like, they can't stop the missiles, they can't slow them down, they just sit there and eat shit. And that wouldn't be too bad, I guess, if they were confident in their ability to dick with the CNP, you know, that wonderful uh, backdoor program they had, but they weren't. They, they weren't even confident it was going to work. So, canonically, by the way, the Cylons pulled an absolute Hail Mary. They expected most of the colonial fleet to be subverted along with a huge amount of, like, civilian infrastructure and stuff based on uh, stations and shipyards and on planets. But they never in their wildest dreams did they think it would get, like, 99% of everything. They expected more around, like two-thirds to 80% kinda of all of the fleet assets, and they expected to deliver as much of a strike as possible so that the coming war, the attrition rates would be in their favor. Like, they were expecting to have to fight an actual war. So they designed these absolute asinine garbage ships with the expectation that they wouldn't even work perfectly for their intended plan, and they had no backups. This is their whole Gotta fleet. That's it. all they have. This is the one ship they have. That's, that's it. And this is why we aren't worried about AI taking over. What would a few dozen or potentially like a few hundred of the Mercury or the Nova or the Valkyrie battle stars have done? Probably reverse the course of the war, or at least firmly given the, the Cylons a solid punch in the teeth and a solid fuck off before fleeing with the rest of humanity. What, what war? There would have been no war. <laughs> yeah, like the, the Cylons strike the 12 colonies, and they only managed to get the nukes off on, like, I think it was, like, five or six of the worlds. So, uh, like, half, basically, right? And then the Colonial mm -hmm. Fleet responded, and the Colonial Fleet sent, like, 400 battle stars to go fight them. And you're like, that, that is an overwhelmingly ridiculous fleet. That, that's, that's impossible. Two or three of them is basically indestructible if they're working together. Individually, right, we're, we're, we're going to come back to that AI thing now about them being able to process really fast, right? So individually, Cylons and the humanoid Cylons can process and think faster than any organic. Even the raiders and stuff, they're, they're fighters, they're often described as being basically unstoppable. Like if you're in their sights, your best form of defense is to pray that something goes wrong with them. That's the best you got, right? That's, that's how effective they are when they, you know, when they're in the swing of things. The older models, the Centurions and the Raiders and stuff, they're, they're all sentient, right? When they operate in large numbers, they essentially surrender some level of their decision-making to good old cloud computing battle strategies. So if one Cylon sees a target in a city, every other Cylon on the planet knows it's there as well, and they can follow along with a strategy that they work up as they go, and each of them follow it like, you know, singular parts of a whole. But when it comes to the humanoid Cylons, they are fully sentient and fully independent. They can communicate with other Cylon models and types, but are in no way beholden to the decision-making process and, like, functions in the same way that they are. So in order to come to decisions amongst themselves, they need to put it to a vote and deliberate on what they're going to do. This is actually what started the Cylon Civil War, as the humanoid Cylons essentially lobotomized the raiders and the ships and the centurions to keep control, and when some of them were like, yo, this is messed up, we're doing the same thing humanity did to us, this is not cool, bro, they were not happy about that, they freed those Cylons, and then the centurions were immediately not happy about that. And you want to know what the centurions realized once they were free from their functional enslavement? What? The centurions realized... Wait a minute, I have guns on my arms, and proceeded to commit butchery against the humanoid Cylon models, and thus the Cylon Civil War began. And that was a, that was a very long and roundabout way to say that the Cylons have vastly superior decision-making speed and accuracy, but the humanoid Cylons need to literally vote on everything. So canonically, like in the lore, actually, despite being hyper-advanced machines that can think a hundred times faster than a human, it takes them so long to vote on what they're going to do and work things out that they react slower than human ships. 
The colonial fighter pilots and battle groups and battle stars can react to situations and fighting conditions faster and more efficiently than the Cylons can because of this asinine command and control thing they came up with. Why do you have like 10 dudes debating on what to do when every single one of them has a different personality? They're going to come up with 10 different things. They implemented a government moment into it for themselves. Oh my god, yeah, the Cylons have advanced so far, they created government, and now everything's going wrong just like it did with humanity. Good job, idiots. You used to be one collective consciousness, now you have to deal with bureaucracy. And we may as well move on from the technical aspects of it and start talking a little bit about the battle strategies that the Cylons actually tried to employ to get the base ship to work. All two of them. <laughs> they, 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 they were not imaginative, okay? The Cylon base star was a first strike weapon with massive volley firepower and a horde of raiders to support it. The Cylons were also aware, to a limited degree, of the weaknesses of their ships and deployed accordingly. Before a battle begins, the Cylons prefer to use scouting parties of regular and heavy raiders to find their targets. Often these raiders will attempt to shadow the target for some time, remaining outside effective gun range of the Galactica and requiring the Colonials to scramble fighters. The reason they do this is because of the base ship's incredibly accurate jump drive. By feeding the positional data and telemetry back to the mothership, the base star can jump into the best position possible before the fighting has even begun so that when it launches its missiles and raiders, it can pose the greatest possible threat to the human fleet. From there, the base star will launch its massive waves of fighters and its multitude of missiles, and in order to cover these forces, uses said missile volley to distract the Holy Wall of Flak, blessed be its name. The battleship will basically dump dozens or hundreds of missiles into space and vector them from a different angle as their raider squadrons to try and distract the large-scale guns, putting the Galactica and any human ships in the terrible position of needing to decide between face-tanking nuclear warheads or dealing with raiders firing missiles down their engines into their gun ports and all of those critical areas that they really don't want explosives going. And that's one of the most common tactics that they use, because that's basically what they employ when they are by themselves. The tactic is the default, because most base ships, when they operate alone, refuse outright to risk their ship in any way in any sort of close-range brawl with a colonial warship. Because they will lose, horrifically. This also means that any time a base star engages colonial ships alone, it has to jump extremely far away outside of effective gun range of the Battle Star and outside the scramble distance of its combat air patrol to ensure that it can't be, oops, accidentally nuked by someone waiting nearby. It is it is pretty terrible. It's a pretty pretty mid tactic to be honest. The other one, yeah, yeah. the other one that we see is, uh, I I don't really know how to describe this. How do, how do I put this? Um, forehead to problem. More missiles. Fire all the missiles. And pretty pretty much it. Like, when there's multiple Cylon base stars, or they determine that they have a crippling numerical advantage, the base stars will move to encircle colonial targets, using their high precision jump drives and their weird inertialist drive systems to quickly reposition around the target from as many angles as possible. From here, they engage at closer range, which is suicide, and dump as many missiles as possible into the target from as many angles as possible, hoping some will slip through and overwhelm the target's defenses. The reason they move in closer is because the farther out they are, the more time Colonial gun batteries have to calculate firing solutions for their flak screens, and getting close minimizes their ability to do that. This is actually how the Pegasus died. In the actual battle where the ship was blown up, the base stars that it's engaging, I think there's three or four of them, basically move into as many positions around it as possible, hammering it from front, back, top, bottom, and all sides with as many missiles as they can. I believe they also blow up the drive system of that by slamming enough missiles into the engine assembly, which is one of the least defended areas of any colonial battle star. I feel like it's one of the least defended areas of basically anything. Yeah, but I mean, like, theoretically, not the Cylon ships, though, because they have their weird engines. Like, if they decided to make just a giant armored monstrosity, like the original dinner plate design, except, like, more modern, it, they could have put guns everywhere and just, like, rammed it into the Galactica, and then the entire war would have been over in, like, ten minutes. So, this second strategy, though has a major problem to it. Because the base stars move in so close, this drastically interferes with their ability to actually launch raiders, as while the ships themselves are immune to the smaller shrapnel and shells, and they can distract the larger gun batteries by 
forcing them to fire flak shells due to the concentration of missiles, their fighter wings are not immune to the flak, and the risk of launching their raiders directly into explosions is quite high and something that they really don't want to do. And so they don't, and it just turns into the slugfest between the ships. And that's their really only strategies. They are either sitting in the ass end of nowhere spamming fighters and missiles at you like only the most annoying of scrubs scared to fight and only the best of War Thunder players in Ground RB, ooh, that's a dig at the community. Or their second strategy is rushing the gun brick in the desperate attempt to find a hole in the wall of flak, blessed be its name, and putting themselves within teeth punching range. Like, these ships suck. They're, they're awful. They're terrible. In fact, I dislike the lack of guns so much, I, I'm, I'm gonna make an entire opinion piece on why kinetic weapons are important in science fiction and why why they should be included like everywhere. Just all the time. Like, don't don't ever make a ship that's just missiles. It's really, really stupid. The, the most notable failure, though, of the Cylon base star is literally years, years, the Cylons were chasing down the human fleet, and these things were chasing the Galactica and the last 50,000 human survivors across the stars, and they managed to inflict almost negligent damage to her. And before anyone in the comments goes, um, actually, I I'm well aware of the odd missile strikes and the sabotage effects and the damage to the Galactica's guns. Like, like I'm aware of all the damage that was done, but let's be realistic here. It was basically nothing. Um, actually, I don't care. <laughs> Basically what we're telling you. The, the numbers here get genuinely stupid. Like, like You're, you're going to scratch your head with how ridiculous these statistics actually are. So almost never was any significant damage actually done to the human fleet by the Cylon base ships unless something went really, really wrong with the Colonials to begin with. There were a few cases where ships had to be left behind to be destroyed because their FTLs didn't work, or sabotage caused them to fall out, or there were mutinies, or just stuff like that, right? There, there is anywhere between 230 and 300 individual times that the Cylons caught up with humanity and failed to inflict any significant damage on the Galactica or any of the other ships in the fleet. They managed to catch the Colonials hundreds of times and accomplished nothing. There is a segment where the Cylons track the humans down and jump on top of their fleet every 33 minutes for days. I think someone calculated it out to being roughly like 200 individual times that the Cylons got into combat with the humans and they didn't do anything. If they had some guns, even even just a few, just a couple, just just one, just put one gun, mm -hmm. like at the very ass end of the ship, right? Make it make it look like a dick. I don't really care. Do anything. Give it one kinetic weapon, and they would have been give able to give you something, anything, right? And the last thing, the the one one interesting thing that I find really funny is that image I showed you where they're in the uh, twin Y hull uh, configuration. Mm -hmm. The only the only reason that exists. I am convinced the only reason it exists is because the animators wanted to show something cool. The actual lore reason why they have that second configuration and they're not just a normal star is because somehow, some weird bullshit reason, completely ignoring that they're not aerodynamic to begin with, when they turn into that Y coordination, they're suddenly aerodynamic enough to go into a planet's atmosphere. It's a giant flying Y. It's not aerodynamic to begin with. It's stupid. They just wanted to put that in there so it could look cool when the, the very first scene when they're firing the nukes on the colonies, they can show them rotating and they're like, ooh, spooky spaceship. Look at them. Ooh, strange. Oh, 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 oh. Pulled a shark. Got rotated. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise, idiot. I rotate myself now. <laughs> These ships are awful. They, they genuinely are. They're a giant flying meat monster crewed by petty bickering slave masters that lobotomize their literal siblings. They lack any effective weapons and they only did as well as they did because it got a mulligan from God. That is functionally the end of the video though because while we could continue to talk more about it, there really isn't much more to say. Going over anything else about it or any not not notable parts about the ship would literally just boil down to it has this thing it's completely useless, the Cylons ruined it, and then we'd move on. So that's functionally where the video ends. The Cylon base star, 
just the worst ship ever. Before we end off, though, patron thanks. Uh, there, I know there's a Gabe. Uh, <laughs> that's about all I got. <laughs> well... I've been that, let out recently, you know, I haven't had a chance to... Yeah, to it's look. it's okay. The The numbers are big and scary. We, we were at, like, one patron at one point, and then we were at, like, two, and then things got a little scary for Steve, and now we're up to, like, six. So, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a little big. It's a, two, quite a few names for him to read off. It got above two. I can't, can't do it, man. <laughs> he ran out of hands to count on after two. <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> Oh, anyways, anyways. David Gabe the OG, Augie, 11 Bravo Crunchy, Terry Higgins, Pedro Munoz, David Grunt. Thank you all very much for your support. It's greatly appreciated. We almost have enough to get Steve his new microphone, so he sounds slightly less terrible. That's functionally the end of the video. Coming up in a few days is an opinion piece, like I mentioned, on why kinetic weapons are awesome and why they should be in science fiction, directly inspired by the fact that I hate this ship and the fact it has no guns. So check that out, probably gonna be coming on the weekend, like Saturday or Sunday if everything goes well. And with that, the video is over, outros are hard, goodbye!